Welcome to the Catholic Economics Podcast. I'm your host, Levi Russell, and today is August 19th, 2020. Today, I want to give a, an overview of Chancellor Dolphus's constitution. So, uh, Chancellor Dolphus was, um, the, was the chancellor of Austria for a few short years in the 1930s, um, af- and after that, he was uh, murdered by the Nazis. Um, but... I was, as I was reading through a biography of Chancellor Dolphus, uh, written by Messner. Uh, so check that book out, please. Um, I it was kind of hit me that there there wasn't a terrible lot of uh, information about the, sort of the economics and uh, and maybe some of the political stuff. Uh, although it's really important to just understand uh, Chancellor Dolphus himself, because there was uh, in Messner and, and many others credit Dolphus with sort of putting. Catholic social teaching at the center point of his government. And so I wanted to know more about uh, the constitution that he had and what his vision was, even though it wasn't really implemented very well um, after his passing, tragically. Uh, so that's what I'm going to cover today. But before I do that, uh, I want to just remind you that you can uh, support the show directly through Anchor. You can also donate regularly on Patreon or Subscribestar if you're so inclined. Uh, And you can also subscribe on YouTube. If you're not on, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you you can check me out on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app as well. Um, But most importantly, please share my show, uh, share it on social media, uh, send episodes to your friends, check out the backlog. If you're new, Uh, I, I really appreciate everybody listening. And I appreciate being interested in this kind of stuff, interested in economics from a Catholic uh, perspective, check out leoinstitute.org, the Leonine Institute, which is the sort of overarching organization here that myself and, and a couple of friends are uh, really trying to build. There's tons of stuff on there. Uh, we're, we're just getting started, but there's a lot of stuff on there uh, for you to read about usury and other, uh, other important um, Catholic economics type issues. Uh, I hope that we're, we're going to, we're going to have the magazine next week or next month, uh, will be available. We're going to do a quarterly magazine, so that'll be coming out really soon. And I hope you enjoy that as well. So to get started here, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to say that Dolphus's constitution was perfect. And, and I really did have a hard time finding, um, good material on this because apparently the constitution hasn't been translated and my German is still very rusty. I'm, I'm trying to rebuild my, my German and, and, and improve on it. Uh, but I, I'm not going to be able to translate this, uh, you know, 30 some page, uh, constitution right now. And so I was looking for something to read on it. And I, and I happened across, uh, an article in the American political science review, which is, um, uh, I would say probably one of the most preeminent, um, uh, journals, uh, in the political science and, and in general in the social sciences. And this article is from August, 1934. And I'm going to, I'm going to have a, a link to this article, but you will not be able to read the whole thing. Um, unless you have some kind of university access or some other type of library access. Um, if you're interested in having a look at the actual document itself, please send me an email. My email is at the bottom of the show notes. Just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll figure out how to get it to you. Um, but this is a, a nice short little article that, uh, it's what, six pages long. It, it tries to kind of get across the main themes of the constitution. And that's, that's sort of what I'm going to go through, um, today. So I don't think that this, the author, uh, let's see, Arnold Zercher, uh, is particularly, uh, favorable to Dolphus or the kind of general <laughs> idea in this constitution. I think he, he seems to be more of a liberal Democrat type, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to get too much into that cause I'm not really sure. It's just, he seems to be a little bit, uh, sort of critical, but I think it's the article still good because it just kind of it seems to give just a, basically a straight description of the constitution. Um, and so I think that's, that part is, is good. And another reason why I think this is an important discussion is because we're often treated when we're talking about Catholic social teaching and, uh, and, and complying with the teaching of the church as it pertains to political, uh, and, and economic, uh, institutions, 
we're we're often told that you know this is just unworkable. Uh, you know, when we're not being lambasted as socialists or whatever, um, you know, we're just told this is unworkable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, despite obviously the entirety of Christendom up to the 1500s uh, was basically organized around uh, subsidiarity and solidarity. Um, but this is a sort of more modern uh, interpretation. So uh, again, this is in the early 1930s, 1933, I believe, 32. Um, but this article was published in 1934. So it was certainly a contemporary type of thing. This the, the author of this journal article is writing at the time that this constitution comes out. So um, here's his, and I'm, this is the only time I'm really going to quote uh, extensively from this article, but he kind of gives a general overview of the constitution. So I'm going to read this, and this is a quote uh, from Arnold Zercher. According to the opening provisions of the new constitution, Austria ceases to be a republic and abandons democracy and parliamentarism. Instead of a popularly, popularly elected sovereign parliament, there is to be a series of six deliberative tribunals, which together will have only a limited influence on lawmaking and no influence whatever over the conduct of administration. In their composition particularly, these tribunals are to give expression to the so-called corporative principle, allegedly the basic principle of the new constitutional order. Interests and classes most of which will ultimately possess the status of legal corporations or public bodies and not a miscellaneous electorate, artificially divided into political parties, are to constitute the social substructure from which these six tribunals will be recruited. So that's his take on what this thing, this new thing is. And you can see that he's certainly contrasting it from the the sort of uh, European model uh, that that you know, we're sort of familiar with where, um, you know, think of England, right? You have this uh, parliament that is basically the supreme body. And, and of course, you have the prime minister, but the prime minister is just kind of the, the head political person in the party that happens to have the largest representation in the parliament. And so uh, I would say, you know, this constitution is more similar to the system we have, but but this article doesn't really address courts, and so I'm, I'm not really sure where the courts fit um, into this whole thing. But there certainly is a, a much bigger emphasis on the executive, which is sort of like what we have relative to a place like in England, but obviously it's, it's still very different from that, um, as, as this guy makes obvious. So he starts off this article discussing these four advisory tribunals. Um, so, so there are six tribunals total and the first four of them he discusses are called advisory tribunals. And so generally speaking, what these things do is they're really just there to advise the, the cabinet. Okay. So you have the president uh, and the chancellor, and then you have the cabinet. So that's the main body. And I'm, I'm going to talk about those guys here a, a little bit later, but these are kind of the, the organizations that I think the author of this article is, is trying, you know, he's, he's picking through this constitution, trying to find things that make sense to him. And, um, you know, as, as this sort of liberal Democrat type, and he sees, uh, you know, he sees these tribunals and he's like, okay, here, this is where I can start. I can, uh, you know, and obviously I'm a psychologizing guy to an extent, but this is kind of what it, it seems like to me. So these four, four advisory tribunals. So these are only advisory. They're not actually making any decisions about uh, what's going to happen from a legislative perspective uh, directly. They're merely advising the cabinet. They're advising the chancellor, the president, and, and the rest of the cabinet for the executive. So uh, the first one is called the Council of State, and this is supposed to be 40 to 50 members appointed by the cabinet, and they're mostly uh, are supposed to be sort of loyal politicians and bureaucrats, you know, loyal in the sense that they're loyal to the to the reigning party, to the president and the, and the chancellor, and they have a 10 year term on this tribunal. Uh, the second one is called the Federal Council of Culture. So this is made up of 30 to 40 representatives 
of different what we I guess what we would call sort of cultural organizations in the nation. So these would be churches, uh, religious corporations or organizations, um, educational, artistic, scientific, and cultural organizations. So these are the groups that this the that Zercher is mentioning are in the in the Constitution under the Federal Council of Culture. So these again, these are people that are taken like they're literally leaders in churches and religious religious organizations in the educational uh, you know sector, uh, artistic type people, scientists, and cultural other cultural organizations. You know maybe the ballet or something. I don't know. Um, so again, this is a, an advisory tribunal. Okay, so they. We'll get to their function here in just a second, but but that's a this is a a, a, a set of people at the federal level, and I, I want to pause just real quick and and mention that you know whenever we have a great article coming out in the magazine next month that I really enjoyed editing, and it was it's written by one of our uh, research associates, and it goes through the history of subsidiarity as it actually was practiced. And one of the things that he mentions that, that really has been sticking in my head lately is this idea that, you know, these kingdoms that were encountered by the Romans and, um, and, and, and sort of persisted even after that, um, up until very recently, um, you know, these kingdoms are small, uh, and these countries are small, you know, in the U S we get used to, you know, we have this massive nation of what, 350 million people. It's, it's ridiculous. Even, even by, uh, you know, even the, the, the quote unquote larger nations in Europe and stuff. I mean, they're, you know, a third or less, uh, the size of the U S and Austria is a, is a, is even smaller. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty small country. And so, you know, I think what, one of the things you know, we think about in economics is information, right? And we're constantly in you know, a sort of Hayek perspective where, oh, the government can't collect all this information. And it's like, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I get where you're coming from. And I, and I, of course, you know, I've, I've discussed in the past some, some objections to this sort of thing uh, in previous episodes. But I think um, what's interesting here is that we're, we're talking about a, a federal council of culture. Okay. So, and 30 to 40 representatives, but this country is incredibly tiny. And so we're really talking about something that like here in the U S we would think of it like maybe on a, on a state level kind of thing. Uh, so this really isn't, um, this isn't 30 or 40 people sort of representing the culture of a, a nation of 300 million or even 80 million, right? This is a, it's a relatively small country. Okay. So next up we have the federal economic council. So this is 70 to 80 members from, and I'm quoting again here, several groups of corporations devoted to economic and professional pursuits. So I think this is where we get the term, uh, corporatism, uh, and, and, or at least this is consistent with that. Um, and then the constitution actually explicitly mentions six categories of corporations, basically by industry. So you've got agriculture, you've got, um, what they call like industry or manufacturing, they've got trade, you know, and, and different sort of what we would call sectors or industries like that. And none, none of these groups of corporations should have less than three members on this council. But you can see here where w what's going to happen is, is you've got um, probably union uh, representatives, right, that might be representing labor in these groups. And again, we're, we're thinking about this is the, the 1930s, right? This is, is fairly uh, recent stuff. This isn't, you know, the guilds from the 13th century. Um, but... Uh, that that nevertheless, I think this is sort of an attempt to create that kind of guild type structure where there is this group that represents the industry completely, not just the management of the industry, not just the labor of the industry, but everyone in the industry. Um, and and their function is to sort of advise the um, advise the executive on what what is smart policy. Uh, okay. So the culture and economic council. So the two that I just previously mentioned, those are elected by the organizations they represent. So I kind of alluded to this just a second ago with the, with the economic council, but so the, the churches, the religious corporations, the educational institutions, and all of these industrial groups, right? So they're all elected. They're all electing representatives to sit on these councils. Okay. Um, so that's, that's where you're getting, uh, these people from, they're not appointed by the president. They're, they're sort of a bottom up kind of thing. So the, the fourth advisory tribunal, the last of the, the advisory tribunals, 
Uh, it's called the Count, the Council of the Lender. Okay, and so this is spelled L A umlaut N D E R. And so uh, in German, there's the little two dots over some of the vowels sometimes in in these words, and it's the way you pronounce it is you put an e to an English speaker. The, the way you can kind of mock pronounce this is put an e after that vowel. So like it's like lender. It's not lander. It's lender. Anyway, um, I can't. I'm not very good with that, but. Anyway, the point is that in Austria, there are 18 of these lender, which are basically like states. Like we in the U.S., we would call them states. Or maybe if you're in Canada, you would call them provinces, right? These are like the the small regional, um, the local bodies, okay? The local governing bodies or the local nations, I suppose, really. The, the lender themselves are like the people of, you know, the state of Maryland or the people of, um, you know, um, the, the province of British Columbia, right? Um, and so, of course, those 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 smaller regional groups have, uh, of course, their own uh, governing structures, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, <clears throat> and so, also Vienna, being the largest city and the capital city, uh, it also has. Um, a representative on this council of the lender uh, who comes just from Vienna, the, that city itself. Right. So think of this as kind of like, um, you know, if you're the mayor of New York city, you know, you, you have a lot of, you have a lot more control than most mayors in the U S would have because New York city is just massive, right? It's, it's, it's larger than most States, right. In terms of people. So the, I think that's kind of the idea here is where, you know, you've got a representative from each of the 18 kind of provinces or whatever you want to call them. And then you have a representative from the largest city as well, the capital city. So let's see. Uh, so these, these four tribunals are just to assist the chancellor's cabinet. And the way they do that um, is they essentially are uh, tasked with providing some information to the the the, uh, the the cabinet when the cabinet requests them to provide such information and the way they do that is they're uh, it's a secretive type meeting and um, you know if there's if there's some kind of issue that is of particular cultural importance then uh, then the cabinet will request a report from the Federal Council of Culture if there's an economic issue then they'll go to the Federal Economic Council if there's um, an issue with like the regional, you know, a certain region or a certain locality, um, or an issue that's kind of popping up between those localities, between the 18 provinces, then that will go to, um, the council of the lender. And then general things will go to the council of state, the first one I mentioned. So that's kind of the idea. And again, these are just advisory. They're just saying, Hey, give us a report. And, and this, these groups, these, these councils are supposed to be secret, right? They're supposed to have a secret meeting. Well, they're not supposed to be secret in terms of who's there, but they're supposed to have a secret meeting and then provide that report secretly to the cabinet, right? It's not supposed to be like this big public thing about what they're saying. Um, okay. So that's the first four. Um, of these uh, tribunals. Okay, so the fifth one is, as Zercher, the author of this article, claims, this is the closest thing to a parliament. Um, and so what they do is they're going to do an up or a down vote only. No amendments, none of that kind of thing. Uh, so if uh, when when the uh, when when the cabinet wants to do something. They, uh, they send a proposal to the diet and the diet itself says yes or no. Um, that's it. We're, we're not going to have, uh, any kind of amendment. We're not going to have any changes by the people in the federal diet, which again, is, is supposed to be the closest thing to a parliament here. Um, if they reject it. Okay. So if the diet says, Hey, you guys over here in the cabinet are off base, this thing isn't a good idea. We're going to say no. So then what happens? Well, then we get a national referendum, right? So then the people of Austria get to decide, is this a good thing or not? And if they approve it, then that means they overrule the federal diet. So again, there's a a proposal that comes from the executive. It goes to the diet. The diet can either say yes or no. If they say yes, then it goes in, right? And then that, that whatever legislation, the, um, the, the chancellor and stuff had come up with it goes into effect. If 
the diet says no, then it goes to a national referendum and the people in general, the people of the whole country decide whether or not this is a good idea. If they say yes, then the diet is overruled, right? So think about how that, how different that is from the U S right. To the extent that we ever have a national referendum, literally on a ballot, right? I mean, normally stuff is going to go through our legislature very few times. I mean, you can see it in the States. Sometimes in the States we'll have national, you know, we'll have state referenda, um, but, but this is a very different type of system. So one special category that he wants to discuss is the annual budget. So the annual budget is, uh, is sent to the cabinet directly, uh, sent from the cabinet, excuse me. So the, the cabinet, right, the executive branch, the president, the chancellor, and the cabinet, they're going to come up with a budget. And they're going to send it to the diet. It doesn't go through these advisory tribunals first, okay, like normal, um, normal uh, proposals would. And I think this, this strikes me as, as a way to get through some of the sort of public choice critiques that we, we often talk about. So, you know, for instance, my, my experience is normally with agricultural legislation. Um, so, you know, so every five years or so we have what, something called the farm bill, right? And it's not so much an issue that of, of the particular regulations or things like this for agriculture. It's the budget for the support of the industry and all the other things that go in there. Right. So because this is a money document, of course, that's what makes the big uh, media hype around it. That's what makes um, all of these nonprofits talk about it. And that's what makes all the lobbying happen. And so what I think is interesting here is that when we're talking about this, this annual budget uh, from in, in, in the, in this Austrian, in, in, in the chancellor's uh, chancellor Dolphus's constitution, um, we, we don't, we don't really have any opportunity for this because these, these representative bodies, these organizations that kind of replace um, lobbyists, right? I mean, that's really what those four tribunals do. They're advisory tribunals. They're here representing the industries and different cultural institutions and things like that within the country. But it's not like the, uh, you know, some industry can just hire some fancy uh, lawyer to be a lobbyist for them, right? That's already done. And so when we're talking about the budget, we just completely, you know, hand in the face of the cultural institutions and, you know, the representatives of the cultural institutions, the representatives of the, the, the local bodies and the representatives of the industries. And we just say, nope, you guys, you don't get to have a say in this. We're just going to go straight to the diet and the diet is going to decide. Um, again, so in this case, there's an, there's an amendment process that's allowed, but it's, it's very different from what we have now where, uh, you know, it seems like now in, in the U.S. we can, you know, well, let's we'll come up with a new amendment, right? And we'll just throw amendments in there. And sometimes they'll, they'll take a bill and they'll just delete everything and they'll just amend it and make it completely something different. But in this case, it was like there was a, a 10-week period that they had, to pro, they had to propose these amendments way ahead of time and, and all this kind of thing. So there is a process for amendments by the diet, though. It's not just an up-and-down vote. And then... Um, if, if the diet fails to accept or reject the budget, then the cabinet's budget is just approved automatically. <laughs> so it's like if they, if they get gridlocked in the, in the diet, then it's like, well, too bad. Um, then it just goes through as is. Um, and you can just forget about your, your say in it. You can forget about your amendments. It's just going to go through the way we want it. And I think that's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, there's there's obviously w reasons why someone who is used to a democratic system or whatever who would complain about that. But I think on the other hand, you know, one of the issues we have with the budget process in, in our system in the U.S. is that we never have an actual budget. We just have these continuing resolutions. And then there's a fight over the budget like every, you know, whatever, six months or something like that. And it's just such a political disaster. Um you know, it, we just, we, we can't even, you know, we can't even come to terms on these things. And so, yeah, okay. You can have complaints about this system, but Hey, you know, <laughs> it certainly does get around all this gridlock. Uh, okay. So finally, the sixth, uh, tribunal is something called the federal assembly. So this is made up of between 158 and 188 members of the four advisory councils, right? So those four advisory councils I mentioned at the beginning, the council of state, the Federal Council of Culture, the Federal Council, Federal Economic Council, uh, and the Council of the Lender, right? 
the representatives of those uh, of this the smaller local bodies. Uh, this federal members from those groups, those four advisory councils, they all come together in the federal assembly. Um, and so I'm going to quote here from Zercher's article: The federal assembly will meet on call of the president to perform extraordinary functions such as nominating candidates for the presidency, attesting the oath of a president-elect, and deliberating upon proposed declarations of war. Um, and so here you see sort of this, um, you know, to an extent, a check on sort of the 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 uh, kind of biggest issues that a president would deal with. Um, so in other words, who the candidates are. Now, you might complain about that, but again, who decides who the candidates are now, right? I mean, look at the Democratic Party for the last 20 years. Yeah, I mean, they have super delegates. I mean, re read up on this stuff. I don't want to get into it, but you know, these two major political parties are the ones that decide who our candidates are. I mean, is this any worse? Is this better or worse? I don't know. I mean, it's my thought is it's probably better. Um, uh, at least in, in, in terms of conception of it. Um, and so, it, yeah, so I think this is interesting. You know, so this, so here is another maybe thing that, that I would think Zercher, the author here would, would sort of like being a sort of liberal Democrat guy. Well, you know, Hey, this isn't so bad. I mean, if we're not going to go to war, um, you know, and, and, uh, stuff like that. And we're not gonna, you know, we're going to let, we're going to let this group of cultural and, uh, sort of industrial, uh, organizations uh, together determine who uh, is going to be in this federal assembly. Um, so I think you know again, there's there's um, it's it's kind of an interesting uh, perspective here for this this setup. And so I want to take a break real quick um, and and talk about a great company that I personally have patronized twice, and I, I hope to again in the future. And I'm I'm working with them on some great stuff, and I really love these guys. Um, so I often talk about buying local and supporting Catholic businesses. So I want to make you aware of a great business run by a young Catholic couple. Colette's Carvings makes beautiful wooden plaques for your home. I bought one of the first ones they made for my son's room. He's named after St. Francis Xavier, and Colette's Carvings did a masterful job making a custom wall hanging to honor his namesake. Themes range from saints to custom family and nursery signs to holiday decor. Devotionals and decor from our home to yours. Check out Colette's Carvings on Etsy at the link in the show notes. So I'll have that link in there in the show notes, and I, I really, I honestly... I, you know, this is my time to run an ad, but you're, you're helping a great young Catholic couple, um, and they just had their first child very recently here. Uh, it's a beautiful family. Uh, okay, so moving on to the, the chief executive here. So the chief executive is made up of uh, a president, a chancellor, and a cabinet. So I've kind of mentioned that already. Um, but Zercher, the author of this article that I, that I went over, um, he indicates that the executive has much more authority than is typical of democracies at the time, right? So obviously this is already made clear, but he's, he's, he's explicitly stating this. He's explicitly saying, hey, look, you know, <laughs> this, this chief executive has a ton of power. Uh, so the president is elected to seven-year terms. And I, I don't think it says in there, I don't have it in my notes anyway, uh, how that election is done. I don't know if it's a popular vote. Um, I know that the federal assembly comes up with the candidates, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway. Uh, so the chancellor, and again, this, the, the, you know, the title of the episode, uh, the chancellor's constitution this is a reference to chancellor Dolphus, um, who was actually before he was the chancellor, he was the, the, the head minister of agriculture. Um, and so I kind of feel like I have a little bit of an affinity there, uh, even outside of the, <laughs> the obviously uh, Catholic angle, uh, you know, my, my uh, work with agriculture kind of made me interested in Dolphus, I think, just uh, based on that. So the, the chancellor is kind of like the he's he's the apolitical one. So the president's the, the political guy, right? He's the one out there like dealing with all the, the conversations and the issues and shaking hands and, uh, you know, trying to get everybody on the same page with stuff and that kind of thing. But the chancellor's job is to just oversee the cabinet, essentially, and to make sure that the legal functions work out right. And, um, of course, you know, Dolphus, I mean, in wartime, uh, you know, he's walking around in military uniform and, and, and doing stuff like that as well. And, and I'm sure, um, you know, that that is, is an integral part of this this constitution as well in terms of, you know, executing uh, military type functions as well. Um, so that's the, that's, he doesn't, I mean, obviously the whole document is kind of about the cabinet, right? Because I mean, really th there isn't much to say about this government at the national level other than just, you know, the cabinet 
has these advisory tribunals and there's kind of a, a, a parliament sort of, but they don't have a whole ton of power. So when, you know, the, the, this Dolphus gets praise from a lot of quarters and even from some people who I would consider to be pretty staunch liberals actually uh, in the Catholic world, because again, the whole idea was to implement Catholic social teaching. Um, and so, you know, one of the things you might be thinking is, well, you know, this, okay, you keep talking about Catholic social teaching, but I'm not hearing anything about subsidiarity, right? I'm not hearing anything about, you know, what about the local powers? What are they supposed to do? Uh, well, in Zercher's article here, he talks about, uh, uh briefly, I think, uh, just a, a paragraph or two about these local powers. And so unlike in our U S constitution, right, where we just sort of have the 10th amendment and the ninth amendment, it's like, oh yeah, anything we didn't explicitly give to the federal government, you know, everybody else is supposed to handle locally. But then of course, uh, in, in practice that doesn't work out. Right. Um, commerce clause and, and the necessary and proper clause and all that kind of, uh, messing all that stuff up, or at least that's, uh, you know, one take. Um, so Dolphus's constitution, on the other hand, uh, devotes two full chapters to kind of laying out the, uh, the, 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 the powers of the lender, um, uh, the, the lender, um, uh, governments, right? What, what can they do? What is, what is their job? What, what kind of things can they handle? And there is one mention of a court in this whole article. Uh, it, there is a constitutional court that is established with the power to decide matters of jurisdiction. So here is this um, this separate body that essentially gets to decide. Okay, if if one of the local lender uh, governments is saying, "Hey, we you know we're supposed to handle this issue, right? Whatever that issue is," um, and the president or the chancellor saying, no, it's actually our job. Uh, well, if there's a dispute like this, there's a constitutional court set up to basically look through this 33 page constitution and say, okay, are you supposed to be dealing with this or not? Who's supposed to be dealing with this issue? You know, whether it's, I don't know, there's not enough water or there's not enough food or there's a, uh, you know, there's a trade dispute or something, right? That, that we figure out that jurisdiction thing with this constitutional court. So, uh, Zercher tells us that the local lender are afforded generous powers over administration, the financial aspects, the legislation within their, you know, provinces. Um, it's, it's sort of a little bit, uh, again, there's sort of a little twist on here. So even though they are afforded generous powers over these things, which is nice, right? It's like when things are just sort of, you know, humming along and life is just kind of normal, you know, you've got your your local lender is is your local province is is kind of handling its own affairs. Um, however, it is also true that the president, the central authority, right, the federal government, can dissolve the diets of the lender, right. So the, the lender are going to have diets as well. They're going to have little parliaments. Um, so the central authority can dissolve those those uh, local parliaments. And they can dissolve the, the equivalent in Vienna, the Municipal Council of Vienna. Um, they can also disallow laws uh, enacted by the local diets and remove the governors. And, you know, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and guess that this whole disallow of laws thing is probably an issue normally when there's a jurisdictional problem. I would guess that on average that's, that would be the case. But I think at the same time there's something interesting here about a sort of a solidarity component Right. And so, you know, uh, to prevent your country from going, you know, 1789 style, right, French Revolution, um, you know, you do need someone to basically determine whether or not, you know, there needs to be, you know, sort of a buck stops here kind of mentality. And I think this makes sense that, you know, obviously a president isn't going to want to create unrest unnecessarily and just make everybody mad. Um, by just dissolving, you know, their local parliaments at whim, you know, and just being a jerk. But um, it, it's certainly a good thing, I think, in the sense that, you know, if if your your chancellor and your president are kind of trying to see everything from sort of the national perspective, that if there's one one or a couple of of, of these little province provincial governments trying to kind of you know throw a wrench in the works, and maybe they're not listening to um, 
you know, the, the, the people who are on the Federal Council of Culture or the Federal Economic Council, um, you know, maybe if there's some, some problems there and they're trying to kind of throw their country into some weird um, tailspin. I mean, you know, think about the U.S. for Pete's sake. It's like, you know, if you live in California, um, especially in a city, you have a completely different life than someone who lives um, sort of in a flyover state city or, um, you know, something like that. Or if you live, uh, you know, far away from a city, your life is very different from someone who lives in an urban area, right? And then we sort of have these things called suburbs that are sort of, you know, whatever in between. But if we're, uh, you know, you don't want these, you know, maybe these local type governments, you know, going off the rails and, and, and throwing wrenches in the works. So maybe that makes sense to have a little bit more uh, sort of stronger oversight uh, when things kind of get weird. And, and it's, I think it's good, too, that, you know, there's a whole two pair, there's a whole two chapters uh, in this Constitution discussing, you know, all of the different powers that these local organizations have. And so you have something there. You have this constitutional court to be able to push back when uh, when the chancellor and the president is kind of getting out of hand too much. So there, there is a little bit of a give and take or, a, um, a, you know, a sort of check and balance. Right. Which is a very popular term in, in the U.S. Right. Uh, so finally, uh, the last thing I want to mention, and again, this is a, a running theme here. Please check out the Messner biography. I'm going to link to it uh, in the show notes. Please check that out. Uh, I really, I, I've been enjoying reading it. Um, and uh, you know, again, uh, Dolphus is praised in in Catholic circles for uh, implementing CST, and one of the main reasons for this is that um, you know Zercher uh, discusses this quite significantly throughout the article, and he says. Uh, a distinguishing feature of this particular of, of the the Austrian Constitution, and again distinguishing it from uh, you know the Germans of the time and the Italians of the time and some of these other um, countries, is is what he says. You know the unique position of the, the Catholic Church. So Austria is declared a Christian state, and it affirms that all laws emanate from God. So that's actually a quote from Zurcher's article there. It I mean affirms that all laws emanate from God. Wow, that's 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 great. I mean, you know, this sort of reminiscent of some of the things we saw at least explicitly in the U S constitution or, or by the framers. Right. Um, but this is in 1930. I mean, we, you know, U S had already kind of given up on that at least uh, explicitly legally. Uh, so this is certainly turning the tide, um, you know, or at least, uh, a 180 from the sort of, uh, cultural rot that, that we had seen, uh, in a lot of places by the thirties. Um, the church is to be given substantial representation on the council of culture. So that, that council of culture, that advisory council, uh, that has 30 to 40 representatives, uh, it's supposed to have the, the, the Catholic church itself is supposed to have a lot of people on there. Um, and so again, I, this makes total sense, right? I mean, this, this makes me think of, um, Hollywood and, uh, the, Back in, I don't even know how long ago it was, but back when Hollywood kind of had this code of ethics that was uh, written by Catholic priests to basically say, like, these are the things you can show on your TV shows, right? Because just they understand that this stuff is very important, that the things you show people and, you know, the things you show children especially uh, is incredibly important and, and has a massive impact on the way people uh, perceive things. Um, so there are some... Uh, you know, provisions for freedom of conscience or whatever, you know, obviously not everybody in Austria is, is necessarily going to be Catholic, but um, the, the state is mandated to guarantee religious and moral instruction for, for children. Um, and the family, okay, so very importantly here, the family and educational institutions are given considerable control over religious instruction. Right. So again, I love this because, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're treated to this idea that the family is is given a big say in religious education. Uh, I think that makes total sense. And again, it's it's a it's a reference to subsidiarity and to this idea that uh, you know the family is the fundamental unit of society. The family is the smallest society, um, and so of course it would make sense that the family is uh, given uh, a significant role in determining how religious instruction is going to work. So that's all I have for today. Again, thanks for listening. I really appreciate uh, everybody uh, jumping in and listening on Anchor or on YouTube. I appreciate you interacting with me on Twitter. I'm on there quite a bit, uh, probably too much. 
Uh, I also have a Facebook page. Those are all linked uh, in the description, as well as the, the Patreon and subscribe star if you're feeling uh, particularly generous. Um, uh, also hit me up by email if you'd like to. I really enjoy interacting with all of you. I know several of you I've, I've been corresponding with. I've really enjoyed that. Um, so please uh, stay interested in Catholic economics and help your friends uh, develop an interest in it as well. As you know, we could use more voices on the traditionalist right. And one of the best ways to do that is with the podcast. I've been using Anchor.fm for this podcast and for another podcast for over a year, and I've really enjoyed it. It's free, and it allows me to upload clips and also to record and edit. It also disperses all of my podcasts to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It also allows me to monetize and to collect donations. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. If you want to join me in being a voice for the traditionalist right, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. 